Thank you, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Excited to worship with all of you. Thank you, Robbie. Oh, we're feeling good at 11 o'clock. Excited to be in God's house today. I'm excited to see all of you. It is the first full weekend of December that we're meeting together. So we are like right on into the Christmas season. Uh, I hope you guys are, are paying attention to how much into the Christmas season we are. Be getting your Christmas list together. Don't be, don't be that person who gets their spouse like the gift on Christmas Eve at Dollar General in the checkout line because you're like, I put it off to the last second, so here you go, baby. Some flaming Hot Cheetos and some AAA batteries. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> don't, don't be that person. Uh, I hope you're having a good, some of you are like, that sounds awesome. Like AAA batteries and flaming Hot Cheetos is great. Uh, I hope you are having a good start to the Christmas season. Uh, we've been having an awesome time here at Cornerstone. We had our Thanksgiving Eve service that we just had a, a little review, uh, a video of earlier, which was an incredible night. Last week, we kicked off this series, How to Survive a Christmas Movie. So we've been enjoying uh, the start of the Christmas season here. And I'm pumped for today's sermon. Excited to preach today's. We're in part two of this series. It's always fun being able to prep for a sermon by reading scripture and by watching 25 Days of Christmas on Freeform. It's just really, it's a cool, a cool experience. But I know there's some people who you're like, I don't really do the Freeform 25 Days of Christmas. You do the Hallmark Countdown to Christmas. Who watches the Hallmark movies? Okay, there we go. For, see, the 11 o'clock, you guys are more honest. The 9 a.m., like I had to coax that out of them. Like some, someone's watching these movies. Hallmark is still around. Like the channel is still around. Someone's watching these movies. Uh, but yeah, we're, this, series, this series is just a lot of fun. What we're doing each week is we're just taking one Christmas movie uh, and we're removing all the trappings from it, right? All, all the craziness around the story, uh, the elves and the North Pole and Santa and all these different things. We realize as we start to pull all of those elements of the stories away from these Christmas movies, we start to realize why the Christmas movies are so timeless. And that's because they deal with and they touch on themes and topics that are timeless and that apply to all of us. So what we did last week, we were talking about National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, as one normally talks about from a pulpit at church, right? We were talking about uh, uh, Clark Griswold, and the main thing uh, theme that we see in that movie, uh, it's not all the craziness that happens. The main theme is a theme of expectation. If you've ever seen that movie before, you know that Clark sets unbelievably high expectations for what he thinks his family's Christmas should be like. It's just, he, he wants it to be perfect. He wants everything to be awesome. He wants his whole family to stay there. Uh, and he sets expectations that no event can live up to. And Clark's not the only one who does that, is he? That's me, and that's you. <laughs> we set expectations routinely in our life that our experiences just, just don't match up with, right? And that's a very frustrating thing whenever we experience something that's very, very, very different from our expectations. But what we learned last week, we learned about how in the middle of those unmet expectations, that's when we get an opportunity to meet God, to encounter God in a really unique way. And so even in the midst of our broken dreams, which were, uh, we had a prop last week, a little jar of ashes, right, that symbolized Clark's Christmas tree, this big, beautiful Christmas tree that at the movie stood for all of his hopes and dreams for the Christmas that was to come, but it ended up all getting torn down, right? It ended up getting set on fire, much like his expectations. And we learned that even in the midst of that, even in the midst of our broken dreams, we can meet God and find him and get to know him in ways that we never dreamed possible. So that's where we were last week. Today, we're gonna continue with our next movie on the list. If you were in here for the pre, you already heard it. We're gonna be talking about Elf today. Who likes some Elf, the Will Ferrell classic. I love it. Uh, my wife's cousin, Jill, she is rocking an Elf shirt today. She's so embarrassed right now. She's rocking an Elf, an elf shirt today. Yes, Jill, it's an incredible shirt. <laughs> I should be like, let's get her up on stage. I'm just kidding, Jill, you don't gotta worry. Jill's like, I am never coming back to church again. <laughs> Uh, this movie, this movie is a great one. It's a funny one. And uh, just like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, as soon as you start removing some of the excess from the movie, you see what the core theme is 
that we're gonna be discussing today. And so we're gonna uh, hit on a story from scripture in tandem with the movie. That's kind of what we're doing every week. We're, we're taking a movie and an event from the life of Jesus to study together. And so I'm gonna ask you, if you would, as we get ready to study God's word, if you would stand to your feet in the honor of the reading of God's word today. We're gonna be reading from Luke chapter eight. If you have a Bible and you wanna follow along, we're in Luke chapter eight. We're gonna be starting in verse 40, and we're gonna read down through verse 48. This is an account during the ministry of Jesus uh, uh, it's in a, a story you may have heard before. This is a pretty popular one, uh, but man, it, it's so good and it spoke to me a lot this week as I was studying for today's sermon. This is what it says. Luke writes, on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus's feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. If you were with us last week, you know that we studied uh, about an event from Jesus' life with Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus uh, in a very similar scenario. Lazarus was sick and on the edge of death, and he ended up dying. Uh, but we find a very similar scenario today as Jesus is confronted by this man named Jairus who has a daughter who is dying. Scripture continues, it says, as Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowd. See, in Luke chapter eight, at this point, Jesus' name is getting famous in this area. People are knowing him. They're knowing him for his teachings and for his miracles. And so people are starting to come and check him out. So he's surrounded. Verse 43 says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Can you imagine that poor woman in that moment thinking like, oh, no. See, to us, this doesn't seem like a big deal. We're like, why, why, does, why, why does he care and why would she be afraid? Well, in this culture, if you are uh, uh, bleeding, if you have any, any kind of issue like that, you are unclean. You are deemed ceremonially unclean, which means you shouldn't even be out in public because if you touch anybody else, you could defile them. You could make it where they would have to be set apart from their family for days at a time. You could make it where they weren't allowed to come into the temple to bring sacrifices and to worship God. And so in this moment, Jesus says, who touched me? This poor woman is probably panicking on the inside. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Peter's like, what are you talking about? Who touched you? Everybody's touching you. There's so many people around. But Jesus said, no, somebody deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble, and she fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith is has made you well. Go in peace. Today, what we're gonna be studying is the theme of identity. Identity. This woman, the uh, woman that Jesus encounters, if you noticed, we didn't get a name for her, did we? <laughs> we have no name. All we know about her is her struggle. And there's a lot to pull out of that idea, and that's exactly what we're gonna do in these next moments. I'm gonna ask you if you will, let's bow our heads and let's pray together real quick. Heavenly Father, we ask that we uh, uh, would humbly approach your word today, that you would speak to us and that uh, uh, we would get exactly what we need today, that every single person here under the sound of my voice, everybody joining us online, wherever they're at, that the exact message, the exact takeaway that they need, that you would deliver it to them personally through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, so that today we would walk away being a changed people, a transformed people, a people who look, who talk, who act, and who sound more like your son, Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Do that today, Father, and we'll give you all the praise. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, you can high five somebody next to you and grab a seat, grab a seat. So it appears like the majority of the room has seen the movie Elf. If that little straw poll was any indication, the majority of us have seen it. Anyways, I'm just gonna give a real quick kind of Cliff Notes review of that movie real fast. So Buddy the Elf is the main character, and, and here's the thing. He's not an elf, right? He, if I'm spoiling the movie for you, sorry, this movie came out like 2002. I don't know what to tell you, right? Um, but Buddy the Elf, he is not an elf. In actuality, who he is, he, he's a human being who one night Santa was uh, delivering presents and he goes into an orphanage to deliver some presents and while he's there, a little baby gets out of the crib, crawls right into his bag uh, and ends up coming back with Santa to the North Pole, right? Santa discovers the baby there and they're like, oh my gosh, there's a baby, what do we do? One of the elves, Papa Elf, is like, hey, 
I'll adopt the kid, I'll adopt the baby. And so they raise little Buddy, they, they raise Buddy there at the North Pole. And it starts to become abundantly aware to everybody except Buddy that Buddy is actually a human and not an elf, right? He's like 6'5". He's huge, he's towering over everybody else, but he still hasn't realized that he's not an elf. And he's starting to get frustrated because all the things that the elves are really good at, he's terrible at, right? Like they, need, they have a quota of making a thousand toys a day. The day's almost over and he's made like 81. Like he's just not even doing it. And so he's frustrated with himself and there's a scene where he's kind of walking around the corner and two other elves head towards the break room, which just the idea of an elf break room is funny to me. So they head to the break room to grab a cup of coffee and while they're in the break room, they're talking back and forth. They're like, man, buddy is killing us today. Like this dude's just killing us. Are you able to help me pick up some slack? And the guy's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll get you. Uh, yeah, man, he's just, he is, he's killing us, isn't he? And the one boss says, yeah. I mean, and if that guy hasn't figured out he's a human by now, I don't know if he ever will. Well, buddy overhears this. And it sends him on an existential crisis. Suddenly he's like, what? I'm not an elf? Like, I'm, I'm adopted? What, what in the world? What is going on here? And in that moment, he has a struggle with his identity. He doesn't know who he is. So he talks to the, uh, the, his adoptive dad for a little bit who tells him about his real dad and how his real dad lives in New York City and he's a book publisher and everything like that. And so the rest of the movie is Buddy going on this trip, going on this search to find his dad and in doing so, trying to find his real identity. The reason we love this movie, obviously, is because, yeah, Will Ferrell's hilarious and the movie's funny. But apart from that, one of the reasons that this movie is so timeless is because this theme of identity and struggle with identity is one that is common to all of us. I don't care who you are, I don't care where you've been, if you've been living for any amount of time, this is something that you have struggled with, a struggle with identity. And if you're anything like me, if you're anything at all like me, the, the thing that makes a, a struggle with identity really hard is when you're struggling with your identity while everybody else seems very set in theirs. You ever experienced that? You're around people who just seem like it's, just, it's like clicking for them. Like they know what they wanna do. They know what they wanna do when they graduate. They, they've got that all lined out. They know what they're doing for their work. They know what they're doing in their relationship. Like they, they just have everything figured out. They feel set in their identity and all it does is make you feel less secure, less certain with yourself because you're not where they are, right? Maybe that's your sister-in-law. <laughs> Maybe it's the family member who is just bragging at uh, Thanksgiving about where they're at. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like way farther down the road than I am. Like I'm nowhere close to you. Maybe it's that person you follow on social media who their life just seems perfect, right? Like everything is just, man, they're, they're set. They know who they are, right? Ever follow those people and like you'll see a video and it'll be like a, a lady will post a video and she's like, you know, I wake up every morning at 4 a.m. and I work out for two and a half hours. Like I work out from uh, 4 a.m. until 6.30 a.m. And then 6.30 I go home and I make, I meal prep for the day. I make nothing but like plain rice, plain chicken breast and eggs. That's all I eat all day. I only drink water. Like they just seem like perfect, right? And then you try to make excuses. Well, like, well yeah, I, I, be nice. I, I would do the same thing if I could, but I have kids. Like I have kids. Unlike you, I can't actually do that. And then you swipe to their next video and they're like, here's what I do with my five kids today. This is what I did. Or I took them like, oh man, like you can't even, even the fake excuses that you have aren't real, right? And you get frustrated because these people seem to have it all together. That is very, very hard. That is very frustrating when you're struggling with your identity and you are surrounded by people who seem to be set in their identity. I think we see that at play here in Luke chapter eight, the story we just read. We see these two people. Jesus is obviously the main character. He's the main character of any story that he's in. But we see these two characters. We see Jairus and we see the woman with this issue, this, this, this physical ailment, right? In Jairus, we see a guy who, what did scripture say about him? He's, he's got a child, so he's a husband, he's a father. Uh, scripture said that he is the leader of a local synagogue. The synagogue that he was a leader of, it's located in Capernaum, which is a big city, it's an important city. And he is the religious leader of that city. So this is a dude who, he's a father, he's a husband, he's a religious leader, he has power, he has prestige, he has a title. You wanna talk about somebody who knows their identity, Jairus knows his identity. He knows who he is. He's set with who he is. And in the midst of that comes this woman who we don't even know her name. <laughs> We're talking about struggling. 
Like everybody else seems, like Jesus, Jesus, the most amazing person I know of, he, he's moving to go help this person because this person's important and prestigious and powerful. He's going to this guy's house to heal his daughter. I'm an inconvenience. I don't even know who I am. I don't even get a name in scripture, right? <laughs> I don't even get a name. That my, my identity is just gone. And here's the thing. A lot of people, we know their identity. The people who interacted with Jesus, uh, it's not just like the rich and powerful over and over again, scripture lets us know the names of people that Jesus interacted with. Uh, there was a, a beggar by the name of Bartimaeus. We know his name. There was uh, uh, Zacchaeus. There was Mary, Martha, Lazarus, all these people that Jesus interacted with. And we get to know their identity. We get to know a little bit about them. And then, then in the middle of it, you have this poor woman who we know nothing about. In fact, get this, like think about it this way. The only information regarding her identity that we know is her issue. That's it. All we know about her is that she's struggling. How many people can say amen to that? You're like, uh, if I have a life verse in scripture, that's me. I <laughs> am just struggling. One struggle, one heartache, one stress after another, one anxiety after another. It makes me wonder how often are we like this woman where our identity is all tangled up in our issues, whether good or bad right? Whether good or bad, our identity, who we are, it's defined, it's shaped, it's molded by our issues, by our experiences, what we've gone through, what we've done. Um, like I said, week one, I had a, the prop up here, you know, the, the ashes. I have a prop for today as well. Let me grab it. Ooh, there we go. Pretty heavy books. Does anyone know what kind of books these are? Not just normal photo books, Scrapbooks, yes, these are scrapbooks. These are my scrapbooks. These are the things that my mom and dad always said growing up, that if our house ever caught fire, besides yourself getting out, get these out. And if there's an option, just throw these through the window and we'll figure something out with you, right? Like these, these are that important. These are that vital. Um, this, is, this is my baby scrapbook. Look at that handsome little devil, right? Oh, um, yeah, these, these are so great. Just all the little stories in there. Oh my goodness. We're gonna be uh, auctioning these off uh, after service. One of a kind Cornerstone Church memorabilia. <laughs> um, I love these things though. I love these and I love going through them and looking at them again. I think this is my uh, uh, baby one. And then there's one, we, we took like a family trip to Asia where we went to Hong Kong and the Philippines and uh, Thailand. It was wild and one of those is that. Another one has like my high school years and stuff. So really, really cool. Like just awesome stuff. And everything in there, at least in these, is the fun stuff, right? Like this is, these are all the good issues, all the good experiences, all the good things that have happened. There's like not a page in here of me like sitting in time out or me getting reamed at. Like that, that's not in here. This is all the highlights. This is the highlight reel. But we all know if, if you have scrapbooks, if you've lived, you know that everything isn't highlight reel. There's the behind the scenes stuff, there's the junk, there's the issues, there's the struggles, there's the sins, there's the hardships, right? And I think where we get messed up and where we miss things a lot is we think either the things that are in our highlight reel or the things that are left out, we think that those things are what shape and mold and make us who we are that these are our identity. That if you wanna know who Jacob is, it's because of all of this. And it's because of all the stuff that you don't see, all the struggles, all the sins, all the shortcomings. But when we do that, <laughs> when we tether our identity to our issues and to our good moments or our bad moments, we are tethering our identity to something that cannot hold it. We're tethering our identity to something that can be gone in an instant, in a moment. Um, even, even the good stuff. Uh, Pastor Brenda shared a, a few weeks back about how in her life, um, if you were to ask her some of her core identifiers, like who is Brenda, who, who am I? Three of the main things she would have listed off is I'm, a, I'm a, a wife, I'm a mother, and I'm a pastor. Like those were three things that brought such joy and fulfillment and purpose and identity to her life. Well, guess what? As she shared, all three of those look wildly different than they used to. Yeah, she's still a mom of all grown children. <laughs> like uh, of all grown children. And so being a mother looks wildly different than it used to. It's fulfilling, but in a much different way than it used to be. 
a completely different season of life. That identity as a mom is not the same identity that it used to be. The identity as a wife, always gonna be Charlie's wife, but Charlie is in heaven now. And so what that actually looks like, how that plays out, what that identity is, is different. Still a pastor, but in a different capacity. It's different. And so even these awesome things, these things that most of us would be like, oh yeah, build your identity around those. Those are awesome things to build your identity on. Those are solid rocks to build your identity on. Even those things eventually give way. Even the greatest things in your life, the greatest identities that you can build on, they eventually give way. They eventually can't hold or support your life in the way that you would hope that they can. So I wanna ask you again, how often are you identifying with your issues? How often are you like this woman from scripture who we don't even know her name? All we know is the issue that she was identified with. How many of us in here today are identifying with our illness, with our history, with our parents, with our bad luck, our good luck, with our relationships? If we do that, if we build our identity on even the good or the bad moments in our life, the issues of our life, we are headed for an identity crisis. I promise you that. I promise you that. That's something that's true for every single one of us. Another thing that's true for every single one of us is how how we try to handle this, how we try to handle the fact that all of us at some point, if we're not careful, will find ourselves in the midst of an identity crisis. How, How we handle it, it's similar to all of us. All of us, every single one of us, we all hunt for a healing in the middle of our identity crisis. When you find yourself in the middle of that like self, just introspective, man, who am I? What am I even doing here? What's my purpose? Like, what, is there a purpose for my life? Like, is, is, is this all there is? I'm just the, the sum total of everything I've experienced in life or is there more to that? When we find ourselves in that place, we all hunt for healing. Even Buddy the Elf, was hunting for healing in the middle of his identity crisis. He realizes, you know what, I'm not an elf, I'm a human, and so what's he try to do? He tries to heal, he tries to heal, he tries to find the cure for his identity, and you know what, since I'm a human, let me act like a human, right? He changes, he, he changes his outfit, he was wearing that skin-tight little, you know, thing. I, someone in between services was like, you should have wore the Buddy the Elf costume. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like I am not shoving myself into that outfit. That is not happening. Uh, So he changes from that and he's wearing a a suit and tie because it matches, it matches what the other people are wearing, right? He, he, he starts, he used to talk in a very like kid-like kind of way. He tries to start talking more like an adult. His diet, his diet, we had people in first service who who knew in the 9 a.m. Anybody in the 11 know the elf uh, food, like pyramid, the, the four C's, Candy, candy canes, and syrup. Candy, candy canes, candy corns, and syrup. That is like the, 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 the foundational elements of any good elf's diet, right? And so there's that crazy scene where he, his buddy is eating dinner with his family for the first time, and they're having spaghetti, right? And as they're sitting down, he's like, hey, can someone pass the syrup? And they're like, there's, well, there's no syrup on the table because it's spaghetti, <laughs> like we're not, we don't have syrup on the table. And he's like, oh, don't worry, I got some. And he pulls it out of his sleeve and just douses his spaghetti with maple syrup. It's, it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. Uh, but he changes. He's like, that's how I used to eat when I thought I was an elf. I, I know I'm a human, so I'm gonna try changing the way I he, he changes all of these things in an effort to try to heal his identity in an effort to try to fit in with what he thinks he's supposed to do, who he thinks he's supposed to be. And I don't think that's much different from all of us, is it? We find things in our life that we try to use to heal or to cure the identity crisis that we have. So we use things like relationships, we use things like friendships, we use things like uh, our family, our career, our hobbies, anything like that, something to try to latch onto to be like, yes, This is the thing that I can tether my identity to. This is the thing that's gonna change things for me, right? So we use things like that. Um, Some of us, I know this is gonna sound funny, some of us use our football team to connect and to tether our identity to. And this is is who I am and this is what I'm connected to. I actually saw on Twitter just a few days ago, uh, someone post this and it had me dying. Um, 
they were talking about, they were writing this in an ironic way. They uh, tweeted at a Taylor Swift like fan account, right? That all they do is post stuff about Taylor Swift. And so this guy tweets at it and he's like, man, what a pathetic life that like you base everything, every bit of your personality, all of it, you, you tether your entire identity to what some pop star is doing today. This is really pathetic, dot, dot, dot. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna log off and go watch my, my favorite football team. And if they lose, I'm gonna let it ruin the rest of my day and the rest of my week. And I'm gonna talk terrible to my family. I'm gonna be mad, I'm gonna be angry. And, and what it's pointing out is the absurdity of how we all do this. We all have these things, these things that we try to, that we, we like make them a cornerstone of our identity a cornerstone of our joy, a cornerstone of this is where I find my purpose, looking forward to the next game, looking forward to the next release, looking forward to the next thing, thing, thing. We, we, we tether our identity to just the craziest stuff in the world, and we wonder why we go through identity crisis. We wonder why we go through just period after period where we're wondering, is this all that there is? Is there more purpose to who I am and to what God has in store for my life? You see, what we need to do, what we need to do is we need to connect to the true source of our identity. And I gotta tell you, all the stuff that Buddy gets wrong in the movie, this is one thing he gets right. Buddy realizes whenever he starts to have his existential crisis of, man, I'm not, a, I'm not this, but I don't know, am I human? And what, what does that mean? When he goes through that, what is his, his urge? What is his desire? His desire is to go and find his dad. He knows if he finds his father, it will lead to answers about who he truly is. My goodness, can we take a page out of that book? We need to be doing the exact same thing. In the midst of our moments when we have an identity crisis, when we're struggling with who we are, we need to search for our father. Let me read one more time from Luke chapter eight. I wanna just start in verse 44 and read just three of these verses again. It says, the woman coming up behind Jesus touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it and Peter said, master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, no, someone deliberately touched me for I felt a healing power go out of me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. Then the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. This woman realized, if I want to be free of my identity crisis, if I wanna find out who I'm, who I'm meant to be, if I wanna actually live to see who I'm meant to be, I gotta get close to Jesus. I have to get close to Jesus. You and I, we will connect to our identity when we connect with Jesus. Your true identity, not the false one, not the fake one, not the, 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 the mirage that you put on yourself or the basket you put on, your true identity, you will only connect to it when you connect with Jesus, when you connect with the person who died for you, when you connect with the Father who made you, when you connect with the Holy Spirit who empowers you every single day. Only in that moment, only when we connect will we know our true identity, our true purpose in life. And here's what's so cool, as we do that, as we connect with the Holy Spirit, as we connect with Jesus, we connect with God the Father, all of the other stuff in our life that we typically build our identity around, the stuff that's happened to us, the issues we're experiencing, the struggles we're going through, both the good and the bad, when we connect to the source the way we're supposed to, then we start to see and understand and decipher those things for what they truly are. We start to see our past and what those people did to us and what people said to us in light of what it truly is and what it truly means. Not just about us, but about them, about the state of the world. We start to see things for how it actually is when we connect to Jesus first rather than going to those things first and building our identity around them. So I've got, I've got three kids, uh, uh, Eden, Evelyn, and Griffin. Eden's 10, Evelyn's seven, Griffin's four. And all of them have had those phrase, uh, stages of life where they phrase things or say things wrong and you kind of need to decipher it a little bit, right? If you've been a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Eden, it was so cute whenever she was little. One of the things that she used to always say wrong, she loves Belle. Belle's her favorite Disney princess and she would always call it Beauty and the Beef. I'm like, that's incredible, I love that. The first day she said beast, it broke my heart. I hated it. Um, uh, Evelyn, our, our middle child, one thing that she would always say, uh, we, like, we'll say okie dokie, and she would say hokey gokey, which just again, you're like, don't ever change the way you say this. Griffin, he's so cute, like, 
whenever we'll be playing games or something like that, like we were fighting the other day, he likes me to pretend to be like a robot that he's fighting and like I'm pulling a lever and the way he says ER is like, uh. So he's like, pull the lever, pull the lever. Like, and it's so cute. But me and my wife, Jessica, were just noticing it this week. It's just this week. He'll be like, pull the lever. That, that was my response. I heard him do it and I'm like, oh, no. The lever, like, no, I will pull, like, little Arnold Schwarzenegger, pull the lever, like, I pull, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear you say it right, because it's so, it's, like, heartbreaking, because they're growing up, right? But the funny thing is, all those things, I could actually, like, decipher. I knew what they were talking about, but so often, there would be times growing up where they're, like, little speech development and speech impediments at certain points. They would say something to me, and I'm, I'm looking at them, like, you are adorable, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> like, I have no clue. You, you thought you were communicating great, but I don't know what you're saying here. I can't make heads or tails of it. And it would be hilarious because they would say something like that. And I'm like, I don't, like, what? I'm grabbing everything. Like, this? This is money? You want money from my wallet? What do you want? And then Jessica from, like, the back room would be like, oh, no, he's wanting his bottle of water. <laughs> like, how did you get that from that? Like, you were able to decipher that? She's like, yeah, yeah. She was able to decipher it because she's mom, <laughs> right? She's mom. She, she's with these kids 24-7. She's around them 24-7. She's able to decipher and speak into that situation knowing exactly what's going on. In your life, you have things going on that, just be honest with yourself, you can't make it heads or tails of it. And you're trying to figure out how they affect your identity and how they affect your purpose and how that affects your future and how it affects everything you, can I just be honest? You don't know. <laughs> like, and I'll say this uh, with humility, even in my own life, things will happen. I'll be like, ah, oh, that must have been why that happened. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not God. I can't decipher it. I can't know that for sure, but I can know God for sure. I can connect to him. And if my identity is in him as a child of God, that's all I need to know. I need to know my identity and how that affects things for me. So what that looks like for me, what that, uh, what that means for me is, you know what? Okay, I need to act like Jesus. I need to talk like Jesus. I need to be like Jesus. That's what I worry about. And then all this stuff, whether good or bad, I, I don't worry about it and I don't try to make heads or tails of it. I allow Jesus to help me make heads or tails of it. I allow him to help interpret things for me and decipher things for me and help make sense of things for me. And I'm able to do that. I'm free to do that when my identity isn't tethered up in this stuff, whether good or bad. If my identity is tethered to something separate altogether, namely who I am in Jesus. When we connect to Jesus, we connect to our identity. And I'll take it a step further to that. Whenever we connect to Jesus, he exposes, he doesn't just connect us to our true identity, he exposes our fake identity, our false identity. The, the, the false motives of our heart, the false and untrue ways of thinking about things, he exposes those. I love the way this is phrased in verse 47. Jesus is saying, hey, someone touched me. I know I, I felt a deliberate touch on my cloak. And then in verse 47, it says, when the woman realized she could not stay hidden. Isn't that how it works? When you encounter Jesus, nothing stays hidden. <laughs> He starts to reveal things to you. He starts to show things to you. He starts to, to, to show you his truth, his truth about who he is, his truth about who you are, the truth about things in your past. Following Jesus, encountering him, it's like pulling back the curtain. We get to see things for how they truly are, and we can't go back again. <laughs> like, like Buddy, when he heard, when he heard that elf say, if he doesn't ever figure out he's a human by now, I don't know if he ever will. In that moment, there was no going back for Buddy. He knew. He knew, okay, I know the truth now. I have encountered the truth, and I can't be ignorant to it. I can't act like I, I didn't see it anymore. I know the truth now, and so everything in my life from this point forward is gonna be filtered through that, that I am not this, I am that. <laughs> that is what it's like when you encounter Jesus. You know from that point going forward, like, okay, I... I can't ignore it anymore. I know these things aren't supposed to be my identity. I know my identity is supposed to be founded and rooted and hinged on who Jesus says I am. And I can't just go back to that now. I can't go back to trying to find uh, joy or, or, or lasting pleasure or anything out of any of those old ways 
of doing things because I know who I am. The truth could not stay hidden and there is no going back. That's because when we encounter Jesus, everything changes. We say that all the time here at Cornerstone. When you experience Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, everything changes. Namely, one of the biggest things that changes is how we see ourselves. When we encounter him, when we start to follow him in a true, real way, we start to see ourselves for who we truly are. And this is the beautiful news of the gospel is that Jesus, not the crowd, gets to make the call on your identity. Jesus does. Not the crowd of people around you externally and so importantly, not the crowd within you. Not the voices that try to tell you who you are because of what you've done, because of where you've been, because of the life you've lived. None of those voices, no one gets to make the final call on your identity except Jesus. Jesus makes the final call. One, the, the last thing I wanna point out from this scripture that we were reading today, and this is so just, it's beautiful, is the closing verse. The woman touches Jesus' cloak. Jesus asks, hey, who did this? She steps up, says, it was me. This is why I did it. And then verse 48, Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That phrase, that word that Jesus uses when he calls her daughter, what it connotes, this isn't just another word for woman or for lady. What this term, daughter, connotes is a loving tenderness, and intimacy, and I know you, I see you, and here's the coolest thing. This phrase, this exact word that Jesus uses here when he calls her daughter, it's the only time in all four gospels we ever see Jesus refer to anybody with this title, anyone. And it's beautiful because in this moment what Jesus is saying is, I know you came into this conversation with me thinking you knew who you were. You were someone who identified with your issue then that's all that you were. I'm telling you, I own the naming rights on your life. (laughs) You you don't get to claim that you're just a nobody, that this thing that happened to you, that what they said to you, that what they did to you, the things that you experienced, that those get to write your, your future and your past and your present. No, no, no. I have bought the naming rights for you. I own the naming rights on you. I get the final call on your identity. Jesus isn't just saying that to this woman. He's saying it through the pages of scripture to us today. What was true for her is true for me and is true for you. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter what has happened in your life, what you've experienced, whether good or bad. The only thing that should ever get to claim identity and naming rights for you is Jesus Christ. And that's the way you want it. Because just like we talked about with Pastor Brenda, eventually everything else, even the good things, will fail. Jesus is the only thing that will not fail. He's the only identity that will not fail. And he is, we we mentioned this last week, Jesus is a skeleton key, right? The, 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 The one key that opens up doors to every door in the house. Finding your identity in Jesus, I'm not kidding you, just about every issue that you experience in life, every struggle, every sin, Everything that you go through, if you get back to the root cause of it, this is why identity is something that you could preach on literally every single week. Because just about every issue we ever experience, every sin issue you ever experience is at its root an identity issue. You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten the future that you were created for. You forgot the past that you were saved from, that you were delivered from. Identity is that core. It is a skeleton key. And the only way to get that one right, the only way to get that one right is by running to the Father and realizing, you know what? I don't belong to my past. I don't belong to my issues. I don't belong to my experience. I am not a captive to those things. I'm not a helpless victim who, well, that's what happened. That's what I've been through. That's what I've experienced. I don't know what to do now. No, I can be set free and I can be delivered because as I put my faith and my hope and my trust and my confidence in Jesus, I belong to him now, not to my past.